there is so much value in understanding yourself and how your body reacts to trauma and really understanding that if if you need to take a break it's okay to take a break if you need to stop talking about it for a while it's okay to stop talking about it for a while if you want to talk about it a lot more and you're in a good place that's totally fine too um, but each person's going to be different just like their journey through grief and healing is going to be different Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Trevor Talks. I'm your host, Trevor Tyson, and I'm so excited for each and every single one of you to be joining us for this amazing conversation today. I'm so excited for this episode, but I just want to give you a heads up that this conversation will involve talk about some potentially triggering topics such as grief, suicide, and a lot more. So just a heads up in case this topic might not be the best idea for you to be listening to today. So just make that conscious decision yourself and uh, maybe come back to it later if that fits best with your lifestyle. As per usual, this episode is brought to you by our amazing friends at Life Audio. Be sure to go check them out at lifeaudio.com. We love them. I'm still surprised that we have people that want to support me and my crazy self. So special shout out to them. I really appreciate it. And we've had our first guest, Miss Kayla Stocklin, on the show around two years ago, I believe, and she's back with us today, which I'm super excited about, but also I've asked my friend Christian Wilson to join us for this conversation to just try and add some fresh and meaningful perspective to the conversation. Kayla has a new book out now called Rebuilding Beautiful, which we'll discuss in detail momentarily, but without further ado, please help me welcome Christian Wilson and Kayla Stocklin. Kayla, Christian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. Dude, that was lengthy. Like, I feel like I just did like a Grammys intro. That was a lot. But thank you for bearing with <laughs> me on great. that. Nailed thank it, you. Man. Nailed it. I don't know about all that, but I want to start off with both of you, starting with Kayla, just giving us a brief intro to who you are. And for people that haven't heard the previous episode that we did, Kayla, just give them an outline of your story, what uh, some of the okay. things you've gone through, and then we'll go to Christian for the same. Okay. Yeah, so over four years ago, I was living a completely different life. I was married to my husband, Andrew. We were leading a large, thriving, growing church in Southern California called Inland Hills Church. And in the fall of 2017, Andrew started having panic attacks. And those panic attacks kept getting worse and led to a depression diagnosis. And we were doing everything we knew to do to heal his depression. He was seeing a psychiatrist. He was taking medication. We were seeing a therapist, like you name it. We tried it. He was taking time off work, spending time in solitude, spending time with mentors. Like we really tried everything we could do to heal his mind and we thought he was getting better. And so he was released to go back to work from the doctors in August of 2018 and hit the ground running, gave two powerful messages on mental illness and then headed into the third weekend, had a really awful day at the office. We all know what it's like to have a really awful day at the office, but when your mind is fragile, it can be um, detrimental. And so it really sent his mind into this tailspin and it was bad enough for our family and for our lead staff team to kind of see like, okay, this guy, his, his mind is a lot sicker than I think he, um, understood and that we understood. And he really needed to take some more time to heal. And so while we were away from him the following day for just a little bit, um, he attempted suicide and he was rushed to the hospital and they ran a bunch of tests and there was nothing that the doctors could do. And so, they delivered the most terrific news and it was the most terrific moment of my life um, when they told us there was nothing they could do to save him and we were forced to say goodbye. And so on August 25th, 2018, he took his last breath. And with that, I took my first in this very unexpected life that I never saw coming as a widow at 29 years old with three little boys who were two, four and five when their dad died. And so it's been this journey the last four years of rebuilding our life. And um, when Andrew passed away, I, in a way, was handed this microphone. Our story kind of went viral viral and spread all over the world. And I was receiving um, messages and emails and handwritten letters from people all over the world. And so I chose to respond. It was important for me for Andrew's life to be defined, not by just the way he died, but by the way he lived. And so I was talking about him. I was talking about suicide. I was talking about all the things I missed, all the warning signs I missed, all the conversations that I missed, um, throwing myself under the bus and all the things I did wrong in hopes that it would help 
help other people do it right. And I started getting messages and emails from people um, where they were saying that it was, it was helping, it was helping them have better conversations. It was helping them um, have tools to lean into the conversation more. People reached out to therapists, people check themselves into rehab. And so I was able to see right away that the story was so much bigger than me and that God was up to something and I just got to play a small part in it. So for the last four years, I've been a mental health advocate. I wrote a couple books, um, Fear Gone Wild released in 2020 and then Rebuilding Beautiful just released in September of this year. So it's been a wild journey. I've been raising these little boys, you know, all while traveling and speaking and writing. And it's been beautiful and terrible and incredible and awful, <laughs> all tingled and twisted together. I love that. Wow. And Christian, before we jump into your story, I just want to respond. Like, I remember August 25th, 2018, clear as day. At the time, I was managing AT&T stores, I believe in 2018. I was like 18 or 19 years old. And CNN was playing in the background. And I remember clear as day seeing Andrew's picture come up on the screen and the wow. story breaking. And that was part of my journey and i believe at the time i was actually being mentored by jared was that yeah so before christian gets in like that's one of the reasons i wanted to have this conversation with the both of you because those were two pivotal moments along with another close friend amy bluel who started project semicolon where you see these leaders that you look up to just kind of go through similar things that you've experienced in your mm -hmm. life. And when you see that and you feel God just pressing on your heart that like people need that hope, they need that encouragement, but then you have the wife come out and speak and provide encouragement and try to help people through their journey. There's nothing like it. You can't compare anything to that. The voice of hope that you've given to this generation so freely, all while raising your children and being public about that is incredible and it's encouraging. And I'm so glad that you're finally at that place where you're like, okay, I'm ready to share like the good, the bad, the ugly of going through that past the grieving process. Not that it'll ever fully end, but you're rebuilding beautiful, no pun intended. So thank you for being <laughs> open to share that. Absolutely. Thank you. And Christian. Yeah. I, uh, my family has long struggled with mental illness, uh, specifically depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, myself and Jared were diagnosed very young. Uh, Jared had, had a, a long bout of, of suicidal ideation. And when he was 19, 20 years old, found himself in church, decided he wanted to become a pastor, share his story. Um, we had a lot of friends who were dealing with depression and suicidal ideation. And uh, we decided that we needed to make a change. And uh, in 2016, launched Anthem of Hope. Uh, it was a it was a long time coming. We had a cousin who had committed suicide. We had an uncle uh, who had died by suicide and uh, we had it running through our family basically and, and felt like we needed something uh, that could help other people. And so Anthem of Hope was started in, in 2016 and Jared committed his platform to teaching people about the hope of Jesus and finding healing and restoration through all of the seasons of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, and letting people know that it's okay to, to not be okay. And it's okay to struggle uh, with, with mental illness and it doesn't make you any less of a person. It doesn't invalidate any of your experiences. It's uh, part of the human condition and we wanted people to know that that is something that much more than we think are dealing with and uh in about three years ago uh actually it was about two weeks ago was the three-year anniversary uh that jared had died by suicide and i've been taking up his mantle ever since it's something that we started together and it's something that I plan on finishing and keep spreading the word of, uh, of awareness for, for suicide prevention and making sure that people know that it's okay to not be okay. And that life does continue. Man, the anthem lives on and God's got this. It's absolutely, it's amazing that in the same like little blurb there, you said like committed suicide and died by suicide. And I really want to point that out because yeah. Kayla 
in the previous episode said something that really stuck with me on why she like advocates for died by suicide. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's a very important topic. Like I, from the moment you, that came out of your mouth, like that's what I've used. And it's very important for people to know the message behind that. So just piggybacking off of what you mm-hmm. said, Christian, Kayla, could you respond? Yeah, and I think you caught yourself I, on the question. I did. I did. I did. Sorry to put you under the bus. I feel like this no, is a great no. moment. Man, I'm still learning through all this too. Everyone is. So yes. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But I think the point that you're trying to get at too is that our words matter yes. and our words are powerful. And that small shift in language, even though it's small, is such a powerful shift. And the words committed is a word we attach to phrases like committed to sin or committed to crime mm-hmm. or committed to murder. And all it does is heap shame and blame onto the shoulders of the person who died. And so saying died by suicide puts pain in the right place mm-hmm. and um, it points to the pain instead of the person and um, it helps anyone. I mean, it helps me talk about it with compassion and empathy and love. It helps me talk to my kids about it with compassion and empathy and love and seeing the suicide, um, not as something that Andrew chose, but as something that happened to him. And I describe even Andrew's suicide as like a tragic accident. I really, truly deeply believe that he didn't want to die. He just wanted his pain to end. And, um, we just had no idea how much pain he was in. And it was really helpful for me too. The psychiatrist said something, I might've shared this on the last episode, a psychiatrist said something to us after Andrew died, and he said that 90% of suicides are impulsive. 90% of suicides are impulsive. And so it's this in-the-moment, overwhelming flood of pain that I truly believe um, Andrew didn't see coming, we didn't see coming, and um, I also described the suicide like a child drowning in a swimming pool at a birthday party. Like, he was literally surrounded by people who loved him, and we just had no idea he was drowning. We had no idea how close to the edge of himself he truly was. And so that small shift in language just helps to have that empathy mm-hmm. and compassion and love for anybody that's died by suicide. Yeah, I, uh, no, I, I totally agree. And it's, it's hard when, when talking about grief and trying to find the language. I mean, um, I still have trouble talking about it when it gets brought up. But uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that the commit, which I caught myself is that someone, someone made that conscious decision and committed to it. And that's more often than not, not what happens. Um, it is like you said, it's, it's an impulse. It's someone wants their pain to end. They don't necessarily want their life to end. And, uh, like I said, I'm still, I'm still learning through it too. It's, uh, something that I am on a, on a journey with and trying to figure out how I'm going to navigate that as well. Uh, but you're right. The, the language that we use, as you could tell, I caught myself. It's a, uh, it's something that is a, a learning process along with the grief. And you are on this journey of trying to understand what happened, understand what your future is going to look like. Um, and with that comes the understanding of the words that we use and how they affect the viewpoint people have on, on the conversation. Yeah. And for all of us, we, tend to talk about like this subject quite a bit, like being mental health advocates going out of our way to try to help people through this. And for myself personally, I've been working on finding a balance with it all because it's like, I remember reading someone wrote after Jared passed about he kept going into the dark cave to light a candle and just kept going back, kept going back. And then that one day he didn't come back. And Mm. I found that to be a beautiful analogy because that's Mm. the heart that he had. He was like, I want to help people that are experiencing this exact same thing. So for me, like most recently, we did the Choose to Live event on World Suicide Prevention Day. And it's like, okay, yeah, we've got all these cool like rock stars coming together and want to have conversations around this topic. But I want to hear from your perspective, what is a healthy balance between like you can't talk about it 24-7 without Mm. dragging yourself down. So for people that are listening that want to use their voice, I'm wondering if there's some dialogue that we could provide on things that we've experienced personally on how to overcome like those thoughts for ourselves, and having a healthy balance between talking about the positive and the negatives that have happened in our lives. Mm. And we can start with Christian. Yeah, it's grief. (laughs) Grief is an interesting thing. It's, uh, what I have come to learn about myself 
is that I pick up on patterns specifically when I'm in a low point. And as much as I love helping people and, and spreading awareness and trying to help people uh, understand themselves as much as we want them to understand mental illness, it's something that you have to be very careful with and, and tread lightly. And I find myself sometimes uh, becoming almost consumed by wanting to help that I find myself in a dark place because I'm constantly reliving the memories and bringing up past trauma that isn't completely healed and probably never will be completely healed. It's something that I'm still working through and probably always will be. Um, but with that being said, there is so much value in understanding yourself and how your body reacts to trauma and really understanding that if if you need to take a break, it's okay to take a break. If you need to stop talking about it for a while, it's okay to stop talking about it for a while. If you want to talk about it a lot more and you're in a good place, that's totally fine too. Um, but each person is going to be different, just like their journey through grief and healing is going to be different. And I think that it's really important for people to know that if, if it's bearing to talk about it and it's weighing you down, uh, take some time to yourself and, and make sure that you are in a good place before helping others. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. It's very difficult, but I mean, if we're all in it together, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to get through. I a hundred percent agree with everything you said, Christian. And it is like this reliving of the trauma every time you talk about it and you never want to get callous to it. You never want it to tell your story and it, for it to not, you know, sink in and settle in. Like for me, I always want to tell my story like authentically. And it's hard for me when I, when you've told it so many times over and over and over and over and over again, um, to not get callous to it and for it to be still tender and, um, real and for it to mean something. And so it, it's been, it's been hard the last four years. I've told my story hundreds of times on different platforms. And I feel like it is this like listening to your body and listening to what you need and listening to, you know, the Holy spirit within you, that's leading you and think you'll know when it's time to rest. Think you'll know when it's time to like hit the pause button and take a break and you can't pour out from an empty cup. And so taking that time and space to fill up your reservoir so that you can pour out from a healthy place and a centered place. Um, yeah, because it is such a delicate and sensitive topic, especially when you're talking about your own trauma or your own lived experience, you are reliving it every time you talk about it. And I know for me, um, I'm actually looking forward to at the end of the year, going into a season of rest and literally taking an entire year off of sharing and writing and social media and like getting really, really quiet for a while so that I can heal my mind and heal my body. And, um, hopefully in the future be pouring out from a place that's centered and rested and more healed and whole. But I think that's just like listening to God's leading in that and just being totally aware of when it's too much or when it's just enough or yeah, yeah. listening, got to listen to ourselves. And that's such an important topic to bring up when it comes to rest. Like people don't realize how important rest is for your body. And I'm learning that. Like <clears throat> I haven't really, I'm, I haven't discussed like publicly some things that have happened to me over the past month, but one of them, I'm, I guess I could talk about it. I was in the ER, like literally from pure exhaustion, dehydration, um, starvation, like all of these things, like it, none of it was intentional. It got to where like I was so stressed and like going, 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 going that I couldn't hold food or water down for over 72 hours. And I ended up in a wow. hospital bed from it. And it's like, you can't keep doing that. Like you have yeah. to rest, you have to recharge. And it's been preached to me over and over and over. But my 25 year old hard headed self had to have that. And to be honest with you, I'm grateful. Like I'm grateful it happened because I'd rather it happen now. Like I'm single, no kids. Like I would rather go through that as a 25 year old to where now I know like, okay, like just as your mental health needs to be taken care of, so does your physical health. Mm -hmm. And you can't necessarily keep being everyone's superhero or trying to and tempting to be if you're not taking care of yourself. So good for you for acknowledging that, especially with three boys, like that's going to be a year that they never forget. And mm -hmm. the big thing is like, 
I really want to dive in, Kayla. What are some of the things you've learned through the process of moving forward with three young children? Yeah. Oh, it's been such a journey, and I feel like I've learned so much um, about myself and who I am and who I'm becoming and who I want to become. And, you know, for me, so much of my identity and who I was was wrapped up within who Andrew was, and he was my whole world. Um, Doing ministry together was my whole world. I was a stay-at-home mom when he passed away, and so I describe it as I went from being in the passenger seat Like if we're sitting in a car, Andrew's in the driver's seat, he's full of vision. He knows where we're headed. And I'm just like along for the ride with our three boys sitting in the back seat. And I describe it like I went from the passenger seat to the driver's seat and I'm looking out across the horizon and I still have these three little boys sitting in the back seat asking mommy, where are we going next? And so it's been this journey of trying to answer that question of where are we going next? And I, for me, it's been leaning into um, God's leading the whole way through and the last two books that I wrote were just so clear that I was supposed to write them that I couldn't escape it. And I knew that I needed to write those. And a huge part of our healing journey has been moving. We moved about two years ago, just an hour South, an hour towards the coast. I can see a little bit of the ocean from my window and it has been such a gift to have a fresh start. I know every story is different. Um, everybody is different with their healing journey. And for us, where we lived before, it felt like I was living in a cemetery. It felt like everywhere I went, I was reminded of a life that was no longer mine. I couldn't go to the grocery store without passing the physical cemetery. I would bump into people in town all the time that went to our church or Andrew was their pastor or they were grieving. And I felt like I just couldn't escape it. And so I really felt led that to be able to keep moving forward with their life and to keep being able to keep learning how to live with the pain, it was going to take a move. And so it was 20 20, the world was already up in the air. My kids were already pulled out of school. And I'm like, you know what? If there's any time to go, we might as well go now. And so we bought this little fixer upper um, down in San Clemente, California. That's a little cute little surfer town, an hour north of San Diego. And it has been the greatest gift I could have given to myself and my kids. Um, just the gift, you know, what, what we did through moving is that we took back the power of our story. And we get to tell our story on our own terms to who we want, when we want, how we want and our stories not being told for us. And so I feel like that was such a powerful gift that I could give to my kids and also give to myself. And we've made incredible friends. My boys have made incredible friends. We're outside all the time. They've picked up new hobbies. They're skateboarding and surfing and doing all the little Southern California Grom things. And, um, Through that move, um, it's been so empowering. I feel like I've been very empowered in the last two years to try things I would have never tried before, Um, like tearing down walls in our house and ripping out floors and handing my boys hammers and sunglasses and telling them to knock out the tile in the bathroom and hopping on a skateboard, (laughs) skateboarding with my kids at the park and, you know, just like doing all these things that I would have never um, tried before, done before. And I think stepping into um, when you when you have these God sized dreams that He's given you, and you're willing to uh, push through the fear to step into them, because it can be really scary and really debilitating when you have these big dreams and you don't know how to accomplish them or you don't know how to make them reality. But when you do, when you take the leap, when you take the risk, when you make the big move, the reward is just so satisfying. The reward is so incredible and probably even more incredible than he thought it was going to be. I mean, God has been so good. The timing that we bought our house was like such a God thing. Like every little part of it, the house that we live in, the distance it is to the boys' school and to the beach and to friends and to community. Like it's just been such the greatest gift. And so I think um, leaning into God's leading in my healing and um, choosing to embrace my pain and welcome my pain and, and just like feel every feeling that I need to feel has really helped me to be able to move forward um, from a place that's like not ignoring the pain or diminishing the pain, but that has welcomed the pain and learned how to live with the pain and um, chosen. It's a choice to choose to build a beautiful life despite it. And yeah. I don't mean to like go on like a rabbit trail or anything but you're basically teaching your kids all the things i suck at like i have terrible balance on skateboards i'm not a fixer upper kind of guy i was telling christian before you hopped on i 
will watch HGTV or Magnolia Network. Like my favorite thing on there right now is Van Gogh, where they like turn these vans into like little <laughs> campers. And I'll have like I remember I think it was like three years ago. I had this inspiration. I was watching uh, Fixer Upper, and I went and like knocked a mirror down, and then I had to pay somebody to come put another one up because I'm just <laughs> terrible at everything to do with hammers, nails, <laughs> screwdrivers, all of it. So shout out to Frank for hooking me up with that <laughs> because. I couldn't have done it without him. But I do have a similar question for you, Christian. Yeah. When it comes down to it, like, obviously there's no children in the picture yet, but how important was community and people that you love being around you in this healing process? And like you spoke at Jared's memorial, like Mm -hmm. that was very, it was very soon, but it was also very honorable. Like you didn't waste any time using your voice. So with all that being said, like, where did that courage come from and how important was the community around you? It, it was definitely God's hand. I mean, it's the only explanation for it. Uh, myself, my sister, my dad, um, we, we all spoke and it was extremely soon after. And, uh, we kind of just came to the conclusion that this is what Jared would have wanted, that Jared would have wanted us to keep the the anthem going and and wanting to still communicate that in light of what has happened uh it doesn't mean that you still can't find hope and healing and we wanted to really push that as much as we could that people understand that he was human too he struggled with the same things that a lot of us struggle with and uh, it doesn't diminish his experience it doesn't put him on a pedestal he was human and we wanted to make sure that everything that he had worked for and everything that we had worked for with anthem that that was something that was still going to be helping people and that that was still going to be a platform that we wanted people to understand that it's okay to not be okay Uh, but the community part was huge i mean i jared was my best friend and i had known him obviously for 30 years we lived in the same house together growing up for 15 and uh, we went to the same middle school we went to the same high school uh, we went to the same church and it was very important for me that i i had a community of people especially that knew jared because it made it easier for me to talk about him Um, people who who knew his character knew who he was we could share memories together Uh, but i i found myself in a very similar situation as as kayla where about six months ago i just i needed to leave it was being in the same city for 15 20 years every time i went to a target or a gas station or drove by a park there was some sort of memory with jared connected with it and uh i felt myself almost becoming almost becoming numb uh, almost becoming distracted and distracting myself in order to numb that pain and not pay attention to what was going on and i i realized pretty quickly that that was extremely unhealthy and that i needed to feel that and I needed to work through what I was feeling and understand my emotions and what was going on with my grieving process and I finally had this opportunity and it was one God moment after another that led to my decision where I said I'm, I'm going by myself I'm moving up eight hours northern California and uh, really wanting to start my life fresh and make sure that I had the capacity to do what I wanted to keep doing. And if I was going to be drained from trying to suppress the the emotions that I was feeling or the grief that I was feeling, that that was never going to be accomplished. And uh, I made the move six months ago and it was one of the best things that could have happened to me because I was forced to sit. Um, I'm 45 minutes away from Tahoe. And so I've been going up to Tahoe, going to lakes. And that was Jared's favorite thing was the mountains and fishing. And uh, I've allowed myself to sit in that and really feel and work through my feelings and what I'm experiencing and and working through that and growing myself as a person. And it was one of the best decisions that I could have made. Uh, The counter side is the the loss of community, but I've made so much community and I had so many close friends, uh, yourself included, that I've kept in touch with and I've been able to call or FaceTime. And that has been a huge factor in my healing process because I haven't felt alone in it, even though physically I moved up by myself. spiritually emotionally mentally i have not been alone because of those connections of people in my life that's so good and just to kind of counter with that when you go to these lakes and all these beautiful places in your new area christian Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned when you were staying in, I'm guessing it was Corona at the time, you would yes. see things that would remind you of Jared. Mm-hmm. When you go to these lakes and see these mountains, is there a little bit of nostalgia that comes with that? And how do you handle that? Like, mm-hmm. how do you turn that grief into joy and learn to enjoy those things again? Yeah, I mean, growing up in, in SoCal, I loved uh, fishing, I loved surfing, I loved hiking. That was That was my safe place, that was my solitude, was going out by myself fishing, catching a wave in Newport, Huntington, whatever. And uh, one, one of mine and Jared's favorite activities together was to go fishing. I mean, anytime we had a day off, we'd grab our fishing poles, we'd drive to some pond or lake that he had found on some random blog or website, and we'd just go try to catch some fish. And I, I find myself most at peace in nature. And it's just something about being in awe of, of God's creation and allowing kind of that piece of God created this entire world. Why would he not be able to help me through whatever circumstances I'm going through? And, uh, I've had that mindset and I kind of had to force myself to have that mindset. It's something that was not natural. It was something that was learned for me, uh, where I'm normally not a still person. I got hardcore ADHD. I got OCD. I'm everywhere. And, uh, forcing myself to, to be still and to, really appreciate everything going on in in the world and my family and being conscious of the good uh, has been a a huge part of my healing process. And so when I go into these kind of safe places for for myself where I feel at home, um, it it really helps me to focus. It, It gets rid of distractions. I'm not worried about my phone. I'm not worried about what I'm wearing, how I look, what I'm going to do in the next couple hours. I allow myself to be at peace, to sit, to be still, do something that is a a very positive memory for myself, which is me and Jared fishing or hiking, whatever that may be, um, and, and reflect. And sometimes I'll write, sometimes I'll journal, sometimes I'll lay there, I'll bring a blanket and lay there for an hour and just allow myself to be with my thoughts and work through what I've been stressed about or why, you know, my neck and jaw hurt because I've been clenching them for the last week and, and working <laughs> through those things and, and really understanding myself in that process and how that is going to help me moving forward with the grief. Wow. And Kayla, I want to touch on the subtitle of the book, Welcome What Is, Dare to Dream Again, and Step Bravely into What Could Be. It's just beautiful to read, and I want to know where that came from and how you're (laughs) applying that to your life. Like, How do you dare to dream again after going through something Mm -hmm. that traumatic? Yeah. Daring to dream again, dreaming again is at the heart of rebuilding and you have to dare to dream beyond the distraction. And you have to be willing to ask God, like, what is the vision you have for my life for the next five, 10, 15 years? And I think dreams only work if we take action on them. And so it's being willing to push, like I said earlier, push past those fears, push past those doubts, push past those um, opinions of other people. I think sometimes the opinions of other people are probably the the loudest and um, the fear of letting other people down. If we make this decision or if we make this move, like you moved so far away, you probably from your family to wherever you moved to eight hours away. And I moved, you know, just an hour away from my family and it was a big deal and it was a hard conversation. And I think um, being willing to follow God's lead and being willing to take those next steps and to take action on those dreams is the greatest gift we can give to ourselves in our grief. And for me, it's been one of the greatest gifts I can give to my kids and my grief as well is a mom that's that's wide awake a mom that's wide awake and um, is willing to dream is willing to heal is willing to try even though if she's gonna fail is willing to make a fool of herself at the skate park on the (laughs) skateboard (laughs) in front of all the little teenage boys that are videoing me on their phone and you know, I think our kids catch so much from us too. And they catch those things, even if we're not trying to teach them something, they're catching all these moments and they're watching us and they're watching how I've navigated all of this. And so dreaming for me has been huge and I'm constantly dreaming. I don't think it's a place where you just like arrive. I'm not just going to one day, like wake up and be like, Oh, I rebuilt beautiful. My life is beautiful. It's great. It's wonderful. It's like, no, we don't arrive. I don't think we ever arrive. I think we're constantly growing, hopefully constantly growing and evolving 
evolving and changing and stepping in and out of a hundred different versions of ourself. And the person I am today is a completely different person than the person that was married to Andrew. And the person that I'll be in five years is a completely different person than the person I'll be today, hopefully. And I think that's the joy of doing life with God. That's the joy of being led by the Holy Spirit. That's the joy of just um, leaning in to these invitations. You know, I think pain can be an invitation. And if you allow it, pain can be one of the greatest teachers of your life. And I know for me, pain has just expanded my view of God. It's expanded my view of humanity. It's given me access to this deeper stream of humanity that I never had access to before. I never knew that people were walking around that I would pass by every single day that were carrying unseen pain. And when you become the person that's like at the grocery store, picking out the bananas and you have all this unseen pain, you realize that there's so many other people that you pass by every single day that are, have their own pain, prescription of pain and pain is pain is pain. And when you walk through something um, so horrific and when those fast, hard curveballs come, I mean, if we allow it to transform us and change us, it can just grow so much compassion and empathy in our hearts for others. And so that was a long winded answer, but um it's been so many things. I feel like the journey of moving forward after losing Andrew has been so many things and I'm still learning and I'm still surrendering and I'm still just sitting back in awe and mystery of it all. Yeah. And as we come to a close, there's one question that comes to mind and it's in regards to like mental health care for church leaders and pastors. Mm -hmm. How do you see like, a, a positive pathway forward on providing better care for our pastors and people of leadership when it comes to like taking a Sabbath, stepping down for a little bit without shaming them. How can the church do better? Yeah, I, this is something that Jared and I talked a lot about. Uh, there were a couple times we had, had spoken and given mental health, uh, either conferences or, or messages that we had done where we had talked about mental health, where we had brought up medication or, or therapy and, uh, the churches had removed the videos. They said that we weren't allowed to talk about those uh. things. And, uh, so it isn't not common. Uh, it's one of those things that has to, I think, be taught because we have been taught otherwise that, you know, if you can't see it, it's not there. And, uh, I think that mental health, especially in the church community, is something that needs to be treated as any other illness or form of health care. It is one of those things that if you are not doing well mentally, if you are burnt out, if you are stressed, if you're depressed, list goes on, you're not going to be able to function at your full capacity, let alone do the job that you're supposed to be doing. And uh, I think that the same way that we treat COVID or the way that we treat other uh, sicknesses like the flu or if someone comes down with some other disease or breaks an arm or uh, even ma maternity and paternity leave. I mean, all of these things are options that we have for people who when we know that they're going to be burnt out, stressed, taking care of other things in their life or healing themselves, uh, we give them that that grace to be able to take that time. But when it comes to mental health, this unseen enemy, uh, for some reason, it isn't given uh, that same attitude. And I think that it's uh, going to be a, a lot of long conversations and getting people to understand the severity that it isn't a choice. It isn't something that you can just wake up one day and go, you're right. I'm not going to be depressed anymore. I don't know why I didn't think about that before. Um, but also the fact that while illnesses can be healed by prayer, that doesn't mean they all will. And that doesn't mean that every depression, um, everybody who struggles with depression or anxiety is going to be healed from prayer. There are also practical steps and things that God has given us like therapists. And for those who need it, going to a psychiatrist who can help those in the same way that we would see any other doctor or physician for another sickness or another illness. And um, I think it's going to take those conversations and, and leaning in with love and leaning in with the, the knowledge that not everybody understands the way that we understand and they don't have the, the knowledge of what someone goes through who is experiencing these things and uh, making sure that there's a very candid, open conversation had uh, about what needs to be changed as far as how we approach uh, these conversations. 
Yeah, absolutely agree with all of that. And just remembering that pastors are people too, mm-hmm. and they're not superhuman. They're human. They're susceptible to all the same things that the rest of us are susceptible to. And I think not putting um, your pastor on a pedestal and knowing that they're human and knowing that they don't have like some special access to God or access to healing and that mental illness is real. Like you said, it's just, it's a real illness, like any other illness. And it requires the same tender care and empathy and time off work and healing that any other illness requires. And so I think, um, pastors can do, uh, they can work on being vulnerable and being honest and being willing to share when they're not okay. And I think, From the stage, it's so powerful when pastors are able to open up and be vulnerable and talk about their own pain. And it helps. I think it can help the congregation to see that they're human and that they're not superhuman when they're willing to be vulnerable and open about their pain. It it opens the door for other people to raise their hand and say, hey, I'm struggling too, or hey, I'm ready to talk about this too. Um, So, yeah. Yeah. And there's so many amazing resources out there for people at this current day and age. And when it comes to pastors, the first one that comes to mind is Energize Ministries. They provide like a safe space for pastors to go and like have a retreat. Like it's Mm -hmm. like hundreds of acres and a cabin, ATVs, all the things like just providing that for pastors. And then we partner with Death to Life, which is an amazing suicide prevention um, service. You've got the Crisis Text Line, um, Anthem of Hope, Mm -hmm. Beneath the Skin, Heart Support. So many amazing resources are available for people. But are there any that the two of you would recommend that maybe I haven't listed or that you strongly believe in? I think on-site is incredible in Tennessee. They have beautiful retreats and options. And I got to go for a Bob Goff retreat, but I know they have incredible like healing um, retreats as well, where you totally go anonymous. I think you, I think you just say your first name and don't even say your last name or what you do or anything. And so it's super anonymous and beautiful, beautiful property where you can go and get healing too. Any of the ones that came to mind, you, you listed. (laughs) All the ones that are any sort of rock related, I got you. (laughs) But we're going to put all those links in the description. And Rebuilding Beautiful is now available wherever books are sold. Christian, Kayla, thank you all so much for being here. This has been honestly one of my favorite episodes so far. And I think we're like 110 episodes in so far. And I'm like... This is going to be a resource for people, so I'm super excited for them to finally hear it. So everybody, be sure to go check out Rebuilding Beautiful, and who knows, maybe Christian will write a book one day. I'm hoping so. We'll see. Um, And yeah, we'll talk to you guys next week. Goodbye now.